Good evening, everyone. Everybody's being real cozy tonight. We appreciate that. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's a great turnout. This is probably the biggest uh, crowd we've had, and ACM has been doing these for, what, four or five years? Four years, so uh, we really appreciate you all being here. I think we've got a great program for you. I'm Tom Squares. I'm Vice President of ACM Community Management. Uh, again, I think you're going to learn a lot tonight. We've got two great presenters, which I'm going to introduce in a minute. I first of all want to thank Carl Kohanek, who's our president and owner of ACM, for letting us put this on tonight and making this all possible. And then I'd like to introduce a few other people that we have from ACM. I'd like to start with Paul Joya. He's our general manager. And uh, some of you who don't know him, there he is. Uh, <laughs> he's happy to talk to you at any time. <laughs> so, but thanks very much for being here, Paul. Uh, we have a couple other property managers. Judy Ramos in the back uh, is here. Uh, Carolina Garcia. Next time I will, though. <laughs> we have, um, we have uh, Mark Gray, property manager in the back there. Uh, it's Diana Dorman was going to be here. I don't know if I saw her sneak in or not, but Diana's here. And then we have one of our customer care reps who made the effort to be here, and that's Debbie Vestikas. So thank you very much for being here also. Thank you, Anthony CM people. And then a special thanks to our marketing I gotta get her, her titles are probably about this long. So anyway, Wonder Woman up here in the front <laughs> who helps organize all this, Stephanie Nowinski. So thank you, Steph. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, our two presenters for this evening and uh, actually Sherm is gonna introduce the other gentleman that he brought with him tonight. Uh, again, they've got a lot of information tonight. There's a lot of handouts in the back. Please make sure that you pick those up. Um, and again, we appreciate it. First, I'm going to introduce Sherm Fields. He's the vice president of the Acres Group. Uh, he's in, been instrumental in working with the law firm that we have here tonight, Kovitz Schiffer Nesbitt. Uh, he's been with Acres for 17 years uh, and is manager, writer, and contributor of the Acres Experts Educational Series. He is also the author of Snow and Ice Management and the Ultimate Tree Hugger book. So those are gonna be available in the lobby. He'll sign copies. We've got eight by 10 glossies he will also sign. So we'll be doing that during the break. Sherm is also a Community Association Institute Rising Star and member of the Homeowners Forum Committee and the CAI Business Partner of Excellence Committee. Sherm is also the principal of Feather, Fin, and Fur LLC. There's a whole story behind that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you another time. Yeah. Why, why are people sleeping in the aisles? Yeah. <laughs> Our other presenter is Michael Krivik. He's a principal at COVID Schiffer Nesbitt. Uh, Michael joined KSN in 2006 and transitioned into the um, Community Association Department in 2011. Uh, where he assists common interest community associations on uh, day-to-day association uh, issues. Michael received his BS from the uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison and his JD designation from John Marshall Law School. He belongs to the Illinois State, Chicago, Lake County, and American Bar Associations. He has also been recognized as an Illinois rising star uh, in the state and a 2015 and 2017 emerging lawyer in Illinois by leading lawyers. Uh, Michael's here to talk about not only the snow removal limited liability law, but he's also going to update us on some recent Illinois laws and update on the Illinois Ombudsperson Act, and we're going to do that part after we have the break, which we will have today. So there's just a couple of minor housekeeping issues. Um, please help yourselves, again, to refreshments. Um, and restrooms, I think most of you saw them when you came in, are right outside the door. Uh, we do encourage questions, but if you have specific questions about what's going on in your association, instead of taking up everybody's time, Michael and Sherm will be more than happy to talk to you about those issues during the break or after the program. Uh, our goal is to be done by 8 o'clock. That's what we, we try to do that. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to the two gentlemen. Thank you both for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. We are extremely grateful for you to be here. We're extremely grateful to Team ACM. Um, getting the word out of this is really important. It's really timely and topical. So thank you, uh, Team ACM, so much. I'd like to introduce to you Stephen Anderson. Stephen is our regional account manager out of our Plainfield facility. So he leads our team of horticulturalists 
and account managers um, from that building. So Steve was kind enough to come tonight and support, and he will interject as he sees fit, which is really good because he's really smart. <laughs> Lots of great information for you guys tonight. Uh, Sherm will lead. Uh, I serve as a resource again with our account management team uh, there for any questions you have. So thank you again for coming and I look forward to a great presentation. Thanks, Sherm. Thanks, Stephen. It's a good day and it's even gooder when the projector works and the clicker works. We're really happy about that. A um, couple little housekeeping things for us. I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet and the sign-up sheet is for two things. If you are a property manager, um, you are eligible to get one and a half continuing education credits from today's seminar, so please sign up for those and get those. If you are not, but you would like to get a snow winter weather action plan for every single event that happens during the winter, which Acres puts out, just put your email address on this, we'll add you to the list and you'll get those. So, and if you don't want to do anything, that's okay too. Um, as I said, it's great to be here, and I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, this is an industry-changing law, act, and it blindsided us. I think a lot of people would believe that snow contractors lobbied to get this. That's not what happened. In September last year, September 7th, Governor Rauner signed it into law, but it was actually enacted when, Michael? Well, it goes into effect on the 25th of August, so, and that's an important date. We'll get into it a little bit further uh, as we are talking. That's an important date because contracts that were signed that predate the 25th of August, so that's an important date, again, to write down. Um, if your contract that you executed predates that, the statute does not apply. Okay, so it's going to apply when you execute a future contract, but if you are one of the, the many out there who have contracts uh, that predate that, you either can you know, rest assured and, and, and sleep well, or you're probably going to hear from your contractor because they want to renegotiate the contract. Uh, so expect to likely hear from your contract. So this is kind of blindsided us. Um, landscapers, our association, the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association, it blindsided them. They had no idea. Um, we also work with um, Snow and Ice Management. It's called SEMA. Um, they didn't know anything about it. Um, we looked at ILAC, um, the CAI's um, legislative arm. They knew nothing about it. So when this fell into our laps, we're kind of like, what the heck does this mean? First thing we do is we reach out to our attorneys. And they have some opinions, but then it's like, well, should we be reaching out to the premier law firm in the industry? And that's KSN, Kovac Schiffer and Nesbitt. And so we reached out and said, what does this mean? And we said the same thing. We didn't see it coming. So we, you know, when you're a law firm, you're expected to be a step ahead of everybody, right? Before you read about it in the newspaper, before you hear about it, somehow we're supposed to uh, know about it. And technology has made that very difficult for us to get ahead of you guys, right? So stuff comes out uh, after, after the governor signs something. Within seconds, somebody can learn about it, and, and we try really hard to stay in front of it. So we track legislation really closely. This one, as Sherm said, caught us all off guard. We had no idea this was coming. There was, as we're going to discuss later tonight, there's a whole myriad of other things that we actually were tracking and were keeping, you know, we were aware of. Um, and this one just kind of came out of nowhere. And as Sherm said, this is a pretty impactful statute. Um, we're going to talk about it more. It's kind of common sense, um, but it, it really does make a big difference to one of, as I'm going to tell you later, I think one of the single most important contractors that you deal with in the Midwest is your, your snow removal contractor. So we reached out and they said, we can't work for you. We represent about 75% of the associations you work with. That is a conflict of interest. But we can sit down at a table and just talk. So we did. So collectively we brainstormed what kind of options can we share with associations and property management that will help them in this whole process as we start to see what case law means to this and things like that. So that's what we're going to share today. Um, I can tell you one thing too. A good piece of news is that two nights ago we did this exact same seminar with ACM. So we've honed, we've kind of honed ourselves. Nah. So hopefully we are a little bit better than we were the last time. We've done this once already together. So yeah. are we going to do better this time? I sure hope so. Okay. <laughs> We're striving to be better. We like continuous improvement. That's right. Okay. So Michael, why don't you kind of share what the new act means? Sure. So uh, the statute. Um, the reality of the statute is this. For many, many years in the industry, we as lawyers, and this again seems like common sense, we were trying 
at all turns to try to put as much liability and shift liability away from you guys as board members as you possibly could. Again, a common sense statement, right? You want to shift as much of the potential liability and exposure from your association, your members, um, to back to the contractor. So what we were doing is we were reviewing contracts for makers and other companies, and we were saying, here's the deal. How about we have you essentially indemnify, defend, hold harmless the association for anything that happens as it relates to snow and ice, okay? Somebody slips and falls, uh, whatever. You, I'm sure every one of you maybe even has a story. Uh, to share about uh, you know, somebody falling on your property or something being damaged, um, whether it be turf, if somebody has a mailbox, it's a garage. Well, we as lawyers, and, and remember, you're our clients, we're always saying, okay, we got to do everything we can to throw it back on, on this guy over here yeah. and, and, and slam this guy. Well, again, common sense tells you, and, and the best way to describe it is, we were saying that they were going to be responsible, like I say, they, the contractor, would be responsible when there was something that could have been a negligent act by the association. Okay, so the association decided not to uh, have them come out and do, and do something. So what the statute does in a nutshell is it uses common sense. It says if the failure to act or action was the negligence of the association and not the contractor or their employees, then you can't hold them responsible. Um, so in a nutshell, all of these provisions that we were putting in contracts that were trying to shift the, the liability to the contractor, we've, we successfully did it for many, many years. Yes, did. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll tell you about all the numbers of claim, crazy number of claims that they were having to deal with. Um, what this statute does is it essentially says, if you're, li if you're responsible under the contract, or, or if you're negligent, you're responsible. If we are negligent, we're responsible. Notably, it doesn't apply to breach a contract, right? So if, if the contract says that he has to do something or his company has to do something and he doesn't do it, he's still responsible for that. Uh, it doesn't, it, it just simply eliminates the negligent acts or the failure to do something or you do something that was done in a negligent way. So uh, the takeaway is gonna be, and obviously we're gonna discuss it in much more, uh, in much more length, is that burden has somewhat shifted now for the association to be much more hands-on. The association, you guys are the board, right? The board is who runs the association. You need to be much more hands-on and involved in the decision-making process, which again, we're gonna talk about right now, in how you, one, retain this contractor, because we're gonna talk about options, and that's what my firm worked with Acres on, um, giving you options as a board as to what level of service you want, and you're gonna see in this discussion how each of those levels either protects you or leaves you exposed, okay? Um, so we're gonna get into it in much more depth, but that kind of is a nutshell of what happened here is, I, I, for me, it was a common sense statute. Um, it was a reaction probably to years and years and years of you know claims being shifted, um, and I think it's appropriate, but what it does is it does point a finger back at you guys as board members much more and, and forces you guys uh, to make decisions and, and to decide how it is you want to be uh, handling your relationship with your snow and ice removal contract. Absolutely. It's all about risk management and your tolerance for it. Um, we're sharing options. Um, it's just education um, more than anything else. We're not trying to direct you to do anything in particular. We do think some ideas are pretty good, but it's really your risk management, what you think your association can tolerate, and how you want to handle safety and liability moving forward. And one other key point, okay, so when we sat down with Acres, and it was actually my partner, Kerry Bartell, um, who sat down with Acres and worked through what you're gonna hear about tonight, it's really important to understand that what we came up with only addresses, it deals with this statute, which is talking about indemnification, who defends who, who's responsible, and in, 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 in situations where there's a, a loss, this does not address any of the other provisions in Acres contract or somebody else's contract. I still, probably much to his chagrin, have problems with other provisions in his contract, and I have a rider that addresses different things in that contract. What we did come up with, though, is just as it relates to and in reaction to the statute that we're talking about. So don't think that because Acres and KSN came together on this particular issue that you don't need to have the contract actually fully reviewed because that would be a big mistake. Correct. Um, ramifications, I guess, some real-time stuff. Um, as Michael shared, these all 
go to the contractor. And all the slip and fall claims went, our insurance paid them. And since 1983, you can only imagine file cabinets, right? Because 30,000 townhomes a year. Um, that's a lot of claims. Um, regardless of the job that the customers or the contractor is going to do, people slip and fall. They just do. Um, this year, however, we've had six. And of those six, four were immediately dismissed from us because we were not authorized to do the work. They went back to the association. That is a first for us. That's never happened before. So the act has teeth, is what I'm saying. Sure. Um, <clears throat> as he, as uh, Michael mentioned, though, um, if the contractor does fail in their with poor workmanship or service failures or things like that, we are accountable. We're liable. Um, it's going to come back to us, just like it should, right? That's only fair. Um, but if a contractor is not authorized to do some work, the courts are going to ask a question. Was that fair and reasonable for the association to not authorize that work in regards to the safety of their community and the, the people who live there? I almost hated to interrupt here, but you just made me think of something. Uh, do, are you on, a, on any occasion uh, going off to subcontractors for some of the work that you may do? The reason I ask this is because I was involved with a case where the uh, subcontractors appeared to be mismanaged and the liability was, or, or the negligence was really a lower down. And I was wondering where does the ultimate responsibility lie? Are you the major responsible for your own subcontractor or does that filter through to me who hired you from the first place? Um, I'll make a comment and I'll ask Michael to you can go ahead and yes, go ahead. Um, we're a self-performing contractor. We have very, very few subcontractors, just maybe under 5%. We do almost all the work ourselves. Um, we've always believed, Michael, and tell me if I'm right or wrong, our name is on the contract, so we are the responsible part. We're the, we would be held liable. Um, not our sub, we're responsible for our sub. And, and so here's a better, another way to look at it. First of all, if that contract was reviewed by me, I would make sure that you didn't have the right to subcontract without the authorization of the association. So one of the, one of the boilerplate things that would go into a rider to a contract would be is that they don't have the right to subcontract without your authorization. Okay. That's, that's point number one. Point number two is, from a lawyer standpoint, I'm casting a wide net. While I agree with Sherm that he's ultimately responsible because his name is on it, I'm suing the subcontractor and I'm suing the contractor. I'm ultimately going to probably prevail most likely against uh, Acres, and then Acres is most likely going to third party in, uh, kind of getting into a litigation strategy, but they're going to third party in the subcontractors. Remember, they most likely have a contract between them and the sub, and that has specific terms as to who's responsible for what when there's a, I mean, we're, we're at the second layer of contract here, right? You have a contract and they have a contract with the subcontractor. So ideally, you, you want to get in front of that, which is why I would like to say to my clients, don't, don't give them the right to subcontract unless they get your approval, so that you can vet the subcontract. <laughs> Correct, but at the end of the day, you're going to, uh, you've got a double, you almost have an opportunity for uh, two sources of recovery, uh, because if they are a separate entity, and, the, and it really depends on what their action was. It depends on how, how severe their action was, if it went outside of the scope of what they were supposed to be yeah. doing. Um, we could go, I mean, that's a rabbit hole, yeah. we could go down a long way. You're currently on retainer with my HOA. Okay. So we submit every magnet, uh, large contract, to you for addendums. Yep. But we don't want to deal with subcontractors. So we would like to say in that addendum that he's responsible for the subcontractor's actions. Sure. Okay? Or no subcontractors at all. Or, well, I, I think that's a difficult thing to say. Really, I do. Because if, he, if five of his snowplow people get sick, he's got to go out and get somebody else in order to fulfill his contract. So there's a subcontractor there that we have no control over, you have no control over, nature has. Sure, I mean, he's gonna tell you though that you wouldn't, in that circumstance, you wouldn't subcontract, would you? Correct. So you would then be denying your clients efficient snow removal by not subcontracting. I'm not accusing of anything. Right. What I wanna ask on a, a, another a similar subject here is liability. Sure. He cannot <clears throat> claim between cars. He can only plow. And we do our own sidewalks. 
Okay. So now we have different types of liability here, don't we? Sure. Now, if somebody slips between a car because we haven't done it, your firm has told us before, we're not responsible. Okay, so, here, so this is, we're jumping ahead. I understand that. Uh, what I can tell you right now, this was, a, this was a huge part of the discussion two nights ago, right? People want to know, you know, every, just about everybody in the room had their own fact pattern and scenario, which is why Tom said, we got to be a little careful because we could literally be here, you know, right. all night. But the, the bottom line is this. At the end of the day, while the statute says what it says, and we're going to go into it at, at length, you have insurance for a reason, okay? So you can do things to try to limit your exposure. You can try to do things to eliminate, but it's impossible to ever eliminate all risk, okay? You can literally, the moment after he come, walks off, off of the, the property and does a completely perfect job under the standards that he's held to, somebody can still slip and fall. Okay, so you're never going to completely eliminate all of the risk, but you guys as a, as a board try to minimize the risk as much as you can. That's part of what one of the discussions is tonight. To answer your question, the theory always was under the law is that you don't have an obligation to take any action as it relates to snow removal. This, I'm telling you what this theory always was. If you do take that on and you do it in a negligent way, you can have exposure. And a great example of that is you decide to salt the sidewalk and you go and you just dump the bucket right in the middle. Okay, you didn't do anything else, but you clearly attempted to try to remediate the, the ice on the sidewalk, but you did a negligent job in doing so. Everybody in my office for years and years and years took the position that as long as you, you, you don't have an obligation to affirmatively do it, but once you try to, you have to do it in a reasonable fashion. I can tell you, and as I told everybody the other night, this statute, is pushing most of the attorneys in the industry, and I can tell you I'm one of them, towards the belief that you probably as an association, because you insure the property that you're talking about when somebody slips and falls out there, that you're probably better off to get in front of it. If you say to somebody, and I've got a lot of associations that say, well, we tell the individual owners to salt when necessary. And you might even supply the salt. You, you, know, you give a bag of salt or a bucket of, of salt and you say, you know, please, on your own, whenever you decide that it's necessary, go out and sell. Okay, I have a little bit of a problem with that, especially now when you get when you look at this new statute, because again, I just said it. You insure that land, right? You insure as the association the common element, the common area. Don't you want to have control over that area where the insurance claim is going to be made when somebody slips and falls? Inevitably, it's going to happen on common element. I think it's one of the things you said the other night is where do most of the slip and falls happen? Over that tonight. Okay, so they happen in areas that are the association's responsibility. So you, I think you're, I think you're rolling the dice by saying to somebody, here's a bag of salt, you handle it. Because you as an association insure it. And, and that goes for just about anything that the association insures. Why would you want control of that as a board? Does it cost more money? Absolutely. No doubt about it, but guess what? You pay now or you pay later. You pay now to get in front of it, you pay later in insurance claims, deductibles, uh, being dropped by your insurance. I mean, it really is a pay now or pay later scenario. Sir, you were first. Yeah, so are you saying that you've changed your advice and say you probably do have an action to affirmatively um, I'm, I'm saying that it's not, this is one of those situations where you probably could get a number of lawyers in a room and they wouldn't all agree. I'm saying my, I'm risk averse, okay? I'm saying that, <clears throat> excuse me, that I want to be in front of problems. And if I know that you're asking somebody, you're asking residents who, one of the residents you might be asking can't even walk out the front door and you're asking that person to be responsible for, for salting their sidewalk, and, okay? And, and you're saying that's a change in your advice from place to years ago. Yeah, because there's, new, there's, new, there's a new statute. And, and again, that's my position. Could, I, could you get a different opinion from a different attorney? Yeah, in fact, somebody in the room brought up uh, you know, Jordan Schiffer, one of my retired partners, for years and years and years. His comment was, I don't believe that you have an obligation to do that. Well, as time goes on, as laws change, um, you know, I can see how you can make an argument that you should be doing it. Now, ultimately, a court of law is gonna decide that. Uh, there's a lot of different case law on natural accumulation of snow and ice versus unnatural. Okay, can I ask, why, since you're good on that, sure. does not still, that's still an important. Correct, correct. There's a ton of case law on that that talks about okay, how it is that you know if if you for the greatest example is the pavement slants back towards the building and and water pools there and it freezes, which would be an unnatural accumulation of ice, right? 
if it was because of poor <laughs> craftsmanship or poor uh, installation drainage, that's why it's accumulating. Or, or a, a downspout is broken, and that's why it accumulates totally at a certain spot. That's still the that's still the law, but we're kind of that's the part of this discussion, but it's kind of not um, because we're talking about the natural accumulation of snow and ice between a you know between two cars. If somebody slips and falls, the question still becomes. There's going to be a lawsuit, right? Somebody slips and falls, they're going to sue the association. And there's going to be exposure. Whether or not the determination is that the association did something wrong or right, that's $10,000 down the road, OK? So I'm looking at it from a get in front of it to stop to even getting down that road. Um, so that's a, it's a hyper uh, sensitive position to take. But that's, I really think that that's where this is going. And we get into the discussion even more so when Sherm talks about the options that are available. Uh, this isn't a black and white situation, guys. The reality is there's a lot of gray. Uh, but the problem is, to get the answer to these questions, it's in court. And it's, and you're, you're battling, and you're, you're a year to a year and a half down the road and spend ten to $20,000 uh, before you ever get to the answer. Yes, ma'am? We self-manage. We take turns vacuuming our common area. We take turns of cleaning our laundry. and. We take turns snow shoveling, and people oh who God. can't because they're bad health, they put 30 bucks in a tip jar at the beginning of the season, and we have some young people as part of our complex, and we pay them 10 bucks for the front, 10 bucks for the back, and they're happy. We can't do that anymore? No, I'm not saying you can't do that. Can we? I, just listen. Again, <laughs> yeah, listen. God, God, God bless the, the setup. And you're probably a somewhat smaller association. No. You're a somewhat smaller association. The answer is, what you're telling me though is you're not hiring a, a third party contractor in, that's most, you just described most three flats in the city of Chicago. They're not hiring a, a company to come out, they're handling it themselves. You have insurance for this reason, right? I mean, if somebody slips and falls on your property, you have insurance for that purpose. So, again, the more you do, and he's again, Sherm's gonna discuss that, the more risk you can put off and, and we can avoid there being potential lawsuits. It's it's kind of like getting it, stopping some, stopping a hazard that you know that exists. Okay, let me change the question. Are we more liable doing it ourselves or more liable hiring someone? You have more exposure doing it yourself always because yeah. if yeah. you hire him to do it and he does it wrong, you sue him and you know, he's responsible. So, but it's not economically feasible if you're a small association right. to pay in acres, no offense, but I don't think you're gonna hire a major snow and ice removal company to handle a real small association. Maybe you would. Um, but so you have to balance, and that's all a lot of this is, is again, sure was gonna talk about that. You're balancing your finances, right? You have a you have a finite amount of money to spend. Okay, you have to balance whether or not you want to go all in. And we'll talk about that, but basically the Cadillac and, and, and spend a lot of money on this. And you probably have less exposure and risk if you do that, but it costs quite a bit more money. And then, or you do nothing and you now put yourself at a ton of risk and you run you, know, you run a risk of having more claims, more slips and falls. Yes, ma'am. Well, in her case, now how big your unit is, it's say it's four people or whatever. 11 units. 11 units. There were, and technically, and that what they need to understand is they're suing themselves. Well, you're suing your insurance company. Your so if you slip and fall, you're going to, it's an insurance company. They're an insurance company. Sure. And it's one, eleven, one eleventh of the, the, the premium is paid for by that individual person. Right. But if you fall and you have a you know, broken hip or something, you know, I don't think you necessarily care. You, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of dollars of bills. And you're, that's why you have insurance. That's why the association. And I think we can agree that the insurance company rather pay the claim than fight the claim. Depending on the issue. Unfortunately, I came from the litigation background. I've seen insurance companies do a lot of crazy stuff. So, Paul, do you have a question? I don't want to pull on all the questions, but back to salt buckets for a second. Um, when salt buckets are used as an, uh, a supplement to ice, right, do you have a comment on that? Normally, it's taken care of, but the vendor can't be there 24-7. Sure. We place salt buckets outside of entrances as, you know, I have zero problem, and I, hopefully I didn't come off and say this the wrong way, I have zero problem with if you're doing that as a supplemental, having it available, because you're right, they don't live on site. They're not going to be able to be there at all points in time. And anything you do is better than doing 
nothing if you're trying to avoid lawsuits. <clears throat> you're trying to avoid somebody falling. I, I'm telling you, you can spread the whole bucket and do the world's best job, and somebody can still fall. Uh, so you're never going to completely eliminate the, the risk. Uh, but again, you're, you guys, as board members, have been charged with trying to minimize the risk for the association to try to you know, do the right things with the finances and spend the money correctly. Well, guess what? That's why you guys have these high-paying jobs, right? <laughs> that's why you guys you know, get the big bucks is to make these decisions. And that's why you come, and kudos to you guys for coming to, to get educated. And that's why you have professional company, you know, uh, companies doing this, and you talk to your attorneys to try to do the right things and spend your money correctly. Let's try to, you yep. want to move on? Yep, we need to yes. move forward. Uh, you good with that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're trying to build a case. What's fair and reasonable, right? Somebody slipped and fell. Michael's going to defend you in a court. What's Michael going to use for his defense? Did, they act, did the association act fair and reasonably? And, uh, One quick comment about that, because I think the last time I saw that. I can tell you right now, I don't represent management companies. I'd be lying if I said I didn't work really closely with management companies because I have a great relationship with ACM, but I don't represent them. The reality is this, what you're going to start hearing back from your <coughs> management companies, and rightfully so, is that they don't want to be the decision maker as it relates to who or when uh, events, if something, you know, Sherman's going to tell you that one of the triggers in one of the pre uh, options is a phone call or an email goes out and says, hey, should we go out and, and do and, and plow or put down salt? In the past, some associations will put that on their manager and they'll say, manager, you're d the decision maker and you're the one that gets the email or call at three in the morning of whether or not they should do that. I can tell you right now, based on this statute, management companies are going to retreat from that position. They are no longer going to be willing to be the 3 a.m. Uh, call because as Sherm already alluded to, you're trying to demonstrate as a board that you're in control of this decision, that you were making reasonable and educated decisions in what you were doing, and the management company, I don't want to speak for the management company, but I, I, I'm pretty confident that they don't want to be that decision maker because that interjects them into whatever the dispute is when somebody falls. So be ready and be prepared to become the decision maker. Somebody on your board is going to need to be prepared to, and is going to tell what, it's not necessarily true if you pick certain options <laughs> service level, but if you're basically the, doing the level where you say, we only will have you come out if we approve it, be prepared to get that email, be prepared to get that phone call, because you're saying you have to approve them to come out, and management, I, again, I don't want to speak for ACF, but I, I anticipate management companies saying, I'm not going to be that decision maker, because I don't want to be in harm's way um, and have ACM get sued when somebody slips and falls because they didn't make the right decision. Okay, so that's what I wanted. You had your hand. I'll hold my question. I think okay. Sherman might be answering it. Come okay, here. that's great. So we reached out. We got uh, expert opinions. Um, very, very little case law, if, if much of any right now. I can tell you one thing though. Um, this was um, about three months ago. Illinois Supreme Court um, made a ruling. Um, Klein Creek, Carroll Stream, um, there's a slip and fall claim. They went to the Supreme Court, who's liable for it? Um, what happened was, snow plow company, large snow plow, did a really nice job. There's piles of snow now, right? Mm -hmm. Up against the sidewalk, on the sides of the driveways, everything. Um, pile melted a bit during the day. Water went down to the sidewalk, the sidewalk was uneven. It pooled on the sidewalk and froze overnight. Um, Unfortunately, somebody slipped and fell and was hurt pretty significantly. Mm -hmm. Illinois Supreme Court um, felt that the liability went to the association for not one, but two reasons. One, um, because the water pooled there and ice was created, it should have had ice melt applied to it. Secondly, they should have repaired the site. Mm -hmm. So two implications. Which touches on the unnatural accumulation issue. <coughs> So what are our options? Um, this is what we have done with our contract. Other, other companies are doing different things. We just want to be up ahead of it. And I can tell you the industry, other than KSN, uh, KSN and ACM and, and Acres, um, very, very few people are talking about this. And so we're very grateful you're here tonight to discuss it with us. So what we decided to do, what we came up with, is provide options for you to consider. 
Um, those are three options. We'll get into great detail. And then we changed our contract um, to automatically de-ice um, freezing rain and freezing drizzle. Um, we'll talk about why we did that and why we feel that that's very, very important. The Cadillac plan, Michael alluded to it earlier. Um, Cadillac plan, if you think about a healthcare facility, a Target store, um, a restaurant, what do they do every time it snows? Salt. They, salt. they salt, they service it every single time. Not sometimes, every single time. That's what the commercial industry does. Um, that's about 30 to 60 times a year, so it's frequent. It's been as high as 80. Um, most associations don't do that. Um, a lot of that is budget driven. And although we do have about 5% of associations that do do that at that high level. Um, so it's 30 to 60 times a year. We understand that that is hard to budget for. Yeah. So we, yeah. So it's cost so, prohibitive. It really is. Remember, we didn't make the law. We're just trying to deal with it, right? Um, so how can we reduce costs? So we went through all of our slip and fall claims, and th they're numerous. They really are. But you would expect that after that many years, three or more than three decades worth of business. Where do people slip and fall? Where do you think the number one slip and fall place is for an association? Mailbox. We said mailbox. Yeah. yeah. Mailbox. Get your end of the day. You're going to get your mail. You got your dress shoes on from work, right? You start to read your mail. You're maybe not paying attention to it. You, you got to get inside and let the dog out or do whatever you got to do. Number one place by far. Number two place. Front door. Front door. It's that, 50, it's that 15 feet in front of a garage door, right? People enter enter the house through the garage. They park their car, they walk around, or they're walking out to their car in the morning. And that area right in front, um, once again, got the dress shoes on usually. Um, that's where they slip and fall second most. And then the other is like the front doors and entries, which many of you mentioned. What's unusual, we don't have slip and fall claims from public walks. Interesting, whether people are, they got their boots on when they're walking, they're prepared for it, they're dressed a little bit differently. Not really sure, but those are the three main areas. So what we're suggesting is that's where we would apply ice melt. Not the whole property, not the public walks, things like that, but to minimize and quantify the area, that's where we would apply ice, ice melt. Maximizing the bang for your buck, right? The second plan is the, really easy to say, the providing the most protection for the least amount of money plan. <laughs> Where did that come from? Somebody is a journalism, has a journalism degree, right? I take really, really good notes. And when I was meeting with Carrie Bartell of KSN, we're talking about this, and she goes, I go, what do you think about this plan? That's exactly what she said. And so that's why we named it. Carrie's great. Like Michael. The both is terrific. Um, <coughs> This is the way, I started Acres in 2000. This is the way many uh, associations handled ice melt uh, prior to 2008. 2008 when the world fell apart, when the economy went in the tanker, right? Whether you're a contractor, an attorney, a property manager, our lives changed just like your lives changed. Because things went to low bid, how do we control costs? A lot of those ancillary things like ice melt were taken out of the budget. We understand why. But prior to that, many, many, many associations would, would do ice melt after every single plow. That's about 48 times per year. We'll give you additional data on that. And it's the same area. We think it's important, so I'm just guessing, we're guessing, that you guys don't like to have your contractor have an open checkbook, right? t &M, stuff like that. Not so fun? Yeah, we you don't know, nickel time. You don't know what you're going to get. Um, we're suggesting that you get a per application rate. So that if you go with one of these options, option one or option two, you know exactly what it's going to cost every single time your contractor does it. Um, so you can manage your, your budget a little bit more like that. And once again, that was named after Carrie. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yes. Is it, is it usually more expensive to get a per application price than... Uh, than to have it just uh, in a all-encompassing 
You're going to save money to do this. Um, there are lean advantages to pre-approval, and they have significant cost savings. And we're going, to, we're going to actually go through in great detail what those are and give you some numbers to potentially help you budget if you, if you desire to choose one of those. The state of the course plan is what we've done forever, forever and ever and ever. What we do as a contractor, um, I would say almost all contractors, is it's going to snow. And we're going to call or email or both either property management or somebody on the board of directors to somebody to get an approval or to authorize, if you'd like, ice melt, to get the yes or no. Um, what happens at that time is it's documented. We get a lot of, nope, we don't want ice melt, we don't have it in the budget. We understand that. Okay, we just wanted to check. That's documented, right? Those four of six that were dismissed from Acres so far this year, we called, we emailed, we did not get, docu we did not get authorization, it was documented, and they went back to the association's insurance. Um, so we call it the state of the course plan. That's what we've done forever. So the contractor's going to call you on the board now, based on what Michael has shared about property management and changing their, their tolerance for making that decision. I, I, I understand it's 30 to 60 times. That's, that's way more than the events. That, that's about how many, that range is approximately how many events we have in Chicagoland per year. It could be just a tiny little something, or it could be a major storm. Obviously, last year wasn't an anomaly no, as far as. I don't understand how the guys in providing the most protection for the least amount of money get approval for the per application without emailing or calling. Isn't it the same thing? No. Um, what that means for, uh, for the option number two is we automatically know that we're going to de-ice after we plot. Because we are pre-approved to do that. Isn't that the Cadillac plan? The Cadillac plan is to do it for every single time there's an event, which could be 30 to 60 times a year. The, the number two plan is that four to eight times per year, only after plowing. You want plow so if you don't have to plow, threshold. you don't apply. Correct. I got it. Okay. Yep. And you're, only plowing after, or you're only plowing after a certain threshold is met. Mm -hmm. Two inches or one inch usually. Yeah, right. Um, for all of us, we're... I mean, we're, we're just suggesting, here's things to consider. If you want to stay the course, that's great. That's great. But our recommendation, our strong recommendation, is document, document, document your reasons, have them in your notes. Um, make sure that you keep that um, information handy in case something does happen. Um, we will do the same. Property manager will do the same. And it, as Sherm said, uh, there's not a lot of case law on this yet, right? So now you have a new statute, and there's going to be, I assure you, and I hopefully none of you guys are, the, the test cases mm -hmm. where there's lawsuits. But as Sherm said, the documentation is so important because that's what you're, if and when there's a claim, what it is that went into your thought process. Was it purely financial? What, what is the basis for why you decided to not uh, have your contractor come out and do something? That all of a sudden matters now. I think courts are going to actually dig into what was the thought process of the board, which is again why management I don't think is going to want to be part of that thought process. But now we anticipate, the legal community anticipates there's going to be much more interest in what was the discussion, what was the process. With the person who answered the phone and said no, what was the rest of the board's authority? What did they tell him, that him or her, what they should or shouldn't do and what are the triggering factors for the service? I just think that, as Sherm said, documentation is going to become so much more relevant if and when somebody slips and falls. And the contractor points back at you as an association and says, as, as Sherm said, this particular case, the Illinois Supreme Court put it back on the association. Uh, and that's where I think if they point back at us, we're to prevail on a claim. We're going to have to be able to demonstrate this is everything we did and why we didn't actually use the contractor in that particular instance. Um, I hope you can all see this photo. I thought it was pretty funny. How bad do you need a job to take a job to wear a bulletproof vest and be a tester? Right? All right, we've all seen these things, right? Freezing rain or freezing drizzle. And we have added into our contract, your contractor may not do this. If you don't want this and you have our contract and you want to cross it off, that's okay. We just want to do what you want. We want to do for you what you want us to do. But when it looks like this, 
and it is just horrible and nasty. Um, we believe it's the highest and best use of your money. Most associations have some additional spend in their budget for ice melt. If you have any, this is the highest and best use because this is where really, really bad things happen. Um, I'll tell you a story. You guys remember January of last year, we had a very, very long and, and bad freezing rain. Put ice everywhere. You guys like remember sleet, that? Sleet, right? I thought it was a, like a sleet, a sleet storm. And then it all, yep, and then it all froze. Yes. Yes. Left, yeah. right? right? And it wasn't thin, it was thick. Yes. Um, 3.30ish in the morning, um, I'm going to go to work, right? But I'm taking my dog out. She's about this tall. <coughs> she hits the driveway, and all four of her legs are straight <laughs> on like that. And I said, we're going to be busy today. We're going to be really, really busy. And uh, Stephen was already up and at it at that point, because we had about 60% authorizations from our associations to go ahead and salt, which is great. Because when you have that authorization, you can plan it. You have logistics in your favor. You can stage material. You can stage manpower, equipment, all that kind of stuff. It's great. But what happens when you're going through the day at, you know, from 3.30 in the morning, now it's 9. And they start, the authorizations start trickling in some more. Right? And the association down here might say, okay, I'm ready. Come see me. Ice melt me. And you're up here, and there's still icy roads. How fast can this guy come down here and do it, right? And does this guy have material? Or does he have to go back to, or she, or does he or she have to go back to the facility or some location to get more ice melt material? Lots of logistics. That went on all day long. <coughs> authorizations come and trickled in, trickled in. We probably had 85, what, 90 percent authorizations by the end of the day. Some of them, after six o'clock at night, after people came home and said, "It's still really horrible." Well, now the guys they worked all night and through the day, and we sent them home because they worked a really, really long day and they're beat. We are now ring, ring, ring. Get back up, fellas. <laughs> we got we got more authorizations, and I could just hear them over the phone. Are you nuts? Right? But we did it. And we got through it. If it's pre-approved, um, it puts all the logistics in our favor. And it will save you money. And we're going to quantify how much money we believe it will save you. Go ahead. Seems like uh, the solution is always ice melt. Mm -hmm. But on the East Coast, they use sand mm -hmm. with the ice melt. Yep. Which gives you traction. Mm -hmm. so, why is there no discussion about something better than ice melt? Or why don't we use sand out here? Um, I can answer that. Pardon? I can answer that. Okay. Um, sand contains water, right? Moisture is in sand. And when it freezes, sand can freeze in the clumps. And that creates some really, really big problems to have to break up the clumps, right? Another thing is... You're talking about when you're applying, not after. Right, 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 right. Yep, so where do you store it, right? It's going to get wet. I mean, it's going to, it's snowing. I mean, it's going to get sure, damp. Sure. So um, that happens. The other thing that happens is it's horrible for sewers. So if you keep using sand, and that eventually gets washed down into, into sewers, yeah. that's a really big, that's a bad problem because it's got to come out. And that's really, really expensive. So in Chicago, anyway, um, we haven't used sand. We don't even have it to, to do it um, forever. Is it illegal in Chicago to apply sand? I couldn't tell you that. Can I take a quick follow-up? Speaking about chemicals, because I know the Army Corps of Engineers is suddenly in my future. If we have discharge systems, we're part of the natural uh, water table, uh, drainage system, whatever you call it, flood them. Now, we're discharging into a public waterway chemicals. Mm -hmm. It's a natural area with Fishing, pond, are we poisoning our ponds? Do we have to have discharge permits from the Army Corps of Engineers? I mean, chemicals of this nature across 25 acres of property at a really quick in one season. You're exactly We've right. Never yeah. been allowed to use a chemical. <coughs> never. We believe that there's going to be evolution in the use of salt or ice melt. Um, I don't know if you've dealt with any of this, Michael, but 
we, we strongly feel that in the future, there's going to be very, very strict regulations on the use of ice melt. And they're going to ask us to use, or any, ask all the industry to use different types of things. Um, and there are different things. Um, they're just really, they can be very expensive, and they have certain degrees of effectiveness. Well, freshwater fish don't like to be in salt water. <laughs> right. right. So, so more, more to follow, I guess. And what's the best ice melt that balances the two concerns? The best ice melt really is proper application. Oh. That's, a, that's, a, that's a legitimate answer. Um, you brand. Because you don't want to salt too much, and you want to control the area that you put the salt down, right? Um, you just don't want to fling it everywhere. Um, now, do you have your, your old-fashioned rock salt, and now they have these calcium, magnesium, all that? Kind of that I think that's the question. Was Generally the speaking, um, the industry still uses rock salt um, for roads, um, primarily um, parking lots. Oftentimes, it is mixed with a chemical that lets it um, work at a lower rate because salt Redu salt effectiveness reduces the colder it gets. So things like magnesium are added yeah, yeah, to it yeah. to let it um, work more effectively at lower temperatures. Um, if you just use straight rock salt, as I was mentioning, proper usage, if it's super, super, super cold, like it's 10 below zero here and just use straight rock salt, you're going to use a ton of rock salt, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And that's what we don't want to do, to this gentleman's point. It does have an effect on our environment. Well, our biggest complaint is pet friendly. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine doing 30,000 townhomes for 30 some years, um, we get a lot of questions on that. Um, salt or the magnesium or the calcium in and of itself is not going to harm the pets in a reasonable fashion unless they're like eating it or something. We just strongly recommend, because I'm walking my dog and her feet are full of that stuff, I'm taking her in the house, I'm wiping her feet off. Absolutely. You know, I, that's, that's the, way, <coughs> the way around it. Okay, what about the villages where I live, they pre-treat the street with the liquid? Yep. Can that be a function of our snow plowing company? Yes. Yes. Um, and what is the advantage? The advantage of pre-treatment um, is that you can put it down ahead of the storm, 48 hours ahead of the storm, it will act, it will melt some of the initial snow. It will act like Pam does in a Teflon pan. Like you spray the pan and the egg just slides right out, right? That's, it does kind of the same thing. Um, a lot of villages now use that. Um, it is made with things like beet juice, of all things. And uh, it, it is effective. The thing you cannot do with it it does not work well at all. It's terrible. I saw a tractor spin down a slope. I can, I can let you know that if you try to do it after a post application, you're wasting your money. What's the name of it? The pre-application? I missed it. Um, uh, I don't even know the name of it. Just a pre-treatment. I mean, you, you consult after, like, if you plow, you're obviously going to plow. And then we sold our roads and, and such after after that. I mean, that's that's a fact, don't you think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, with this, the only difference with this is that I told I told you, you nobody likes an open checkbook, right? Um, but this is for us. It's not a per application rate. It is a bag or a ton um, situation because we don't know how much we're going to get, right? We can't quantify the area or with the quantity. It could be just a little sheen like this, or it could be like this. It makes a tremendous difference in the amount of chemical you're using. We can give you a ballpark, but it's going to be a bag or a ton rate. So, how, so a couple of questions on pricing. How does this affect pricing? This is going to cost money, and we really respect that. It's significant. You're going to see some numbers in a minute. We're very transparent here. You're going to need to see some numbers in a minute that are going to make you go. And we understand that a 25 cent assessment increase in your association, if we're involved, we could lose the contract over that, right? Or he could lose the contract over that. Or ACM could lose the contract over an increase like that. We're not talking 25 cents. So, 
how do we find ways to help? Because this really is more revenue to a contractor, right? We're going to take our pieces of equipment that used to work this many times, and now they're going to work this many times. There's efficiencies there, right? Um, that asset is now being used more often, and that lowers the cost of the per occurrence. It's also a lean system. Pre-approval creates an ability for us or your contractor to figure out things before the storm, to plan before the storm, which is so much better than during the storm. During the storm, you're running and gunning. It's, it's all hands on deck, right? Um, so we're recommending that if you're talking to your contractor, you're going to something like this, ask them for a contract extension with no price increases for three years. Why is that important? Labor is through the roof. There is a labor shortage, not just for snowplow, not just for landscaping, just a general labor shortage in Illinois. Um, trivia question. I just like, want to make sure I heard you right. You, L E A N, not L E I N. You said a lean situation. L E A N, yes, yes, thank you. Yes, exactly right. That's, that's an important point. How much does the guy pushing a snowblower or using a shovel make? per hour in a snowstorm this year? How much? $25 an hour. Yeah, a lot of them are 25 bucks an hour. It's not that $5 an hour guy anymore. It's just not. How much did that tractor operator get? <coughs> 35. 35 bucks an hour. Right, so the more, the more efficient you can be, that's a lot of savings. Because labor is expensive now. We're not even talking overtime. Um, we believe that with pre-approval, your contractor should be able to discount pricing 20% in nice snow applications. So really significant decrease. You guys only get paid when it storms, right? Like they're not on 40 hour a week salary or what? Um, we, we have different contracts. We have seasonal contracts that we're paid whether it snows or not. And we have per occurrence contracts. Um, that we only get paid when it does snow. What's better? What's better for your association, a per occurrence contract or a just a monthly standard? That's how it works out. <laughs> yeah, one year you don't win. Roll, roll, roll the dice. Year, you know. Roll the dice. <laughs> we, we, and I'm pointing the finger at we, right? Um, did, did a study looking at many years of per push versus monthly seasonal contract. Pick a lane, stick with it. Because over time, there's only a plus or minus 3% difference. Wow. Don't try to guess. Do not try to guess. Pick a lane. You'll be, you'll be good in the long run. But the seasonal, don't they have only so many pushes on the seasonal run? Some contracts do. Some contracts do. This is not an acres commercial. We took that out. Um, unlimited plows, two to eight inches. It's what? It's what? Looking at your contracts, That's what their contracts the contracts I've seen before from various different companies also state that after so many inches, it's up for grabs. You don't put, you're not placing a limitation on the inches. No. That's something that they should all be careful about. Sure. He just he just said, for instance, he just said two to eight inches unlimited. Right. Some contracts will say anything over. The eight inches is then additional charge. So that's that's a highly highly relevant thing in the Midwest where you can get plastic. And, and we have that is our contract. Yep. So with uh, with the automatic authorization, save twenty percent. If you go to stay the course plan, where we're calling you or emailing you, the pricing stays the same. Here's some real numbers. That's why I said we're really transparent. You can share these. We think these are fair numbers. We think these are industry averages. But if you share them with a contractor and they go, oh, they're at 42, I'll do it 40. That's fine. We're willing to take the risk. We think we, it's more important to educate. But what that really means is <clears throat> for freezing rain and freezing drizzle, we know we're going to go out and do it. It'll save you 20% so rather than the $42 a bag. It goes on to $33.60 per bag. Same thing with the plowing or ice melt application after plowing, except it's a little bit deeper discount. Why would it be a little bit deeper discount? Already there. Already there. This is a really smart crowd. Um, it's true. It's very, very true. 
Uh, we're already there, we're mobilized, there's no travel. We're right there, ready to go. Good um, information makes good decisions. Um, in the last 13 years, our average for a two inch trigger has been 6.38. And if you can take out that year of 13, 14, which none of us liked, that was just a horrible 80 inch year, and we didn't sleep, and you probably didn't sleep, and it was just really, really bad for everybody's budget. Um, it's even lower than that. Um, a one inch trigger, just about 10, 10 per year. <clears throat> I told you this little story about a quarter difference. This is not a quarter, but this is what it is. Um, on average, we budget, in our contract, and we're bidding your contract, we budget for eight storms a year. So our estimator says we're going to put in enough money into that contract to, to plow you eight times, right? We're going to give you unlimited from two to eight, but we're going to put in eight to cover us on cost. Um, so it's about $16 per unit per store times eight storms. We probably aren't going to get that many, but we might. Um, it's $128 over a year, or $10.67 per month per unit. If we take a look at freezing rain and drizzle, we get one or two of them a year. Same kind of deal, um, about $16.80 per unit per storm times two, $2.80 per month. Total cost per unit, $13.47 per unit per month. You would have to subtract what's already in your ancillary budget for snow removal and ice and snow and ice management. And you'd be accountable if you wanted to go with one of these plans, if you're considering it, to come up with that amount of money. So are these numbers including plowing, or is this just the additional cost of the ice mold? Additional cost of the ice mold. Good question. If it was not pre-approved, you would be paying more. Um, it would be $17.50 per month. And if you look at the whole thing, pre-approved $13.47 a month, a la carte $17.50, so about a 23.1% difference in price to be more lean and to be proactive. You were first. Isn't it true that if you have a contract rather than a per push, if you have a yearly contract, you're, you're higher on the priority list when the snow falls for service. Not necessarily. Oh. How do you That's a great question, by the way. I, did, I always thought that you, you had priority if you had a, a yearly How do you um, contract. Um, I can only speak for acres. Okay. Um, but I can give some good examples. We dedicate men and women and equipment. We do have quite a few women to plow and shovel and all that kind of stuff. Um, we dedicate the appropriate amount of men and women and equipment per property because when it snows, you can't be second, you can't be third, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be now. Your contract says you have a four inch storm, you have to have that thing plowed six to eight hours after it's done snowing. Right? You can't send the crew from here to here to here to here and get it all done. Um, same thing happens with per occurrence. Um, an example, somebody brought up Maple Hill today. Who brought up Maple Hill? You did. I did. Um, Maple Hill is our account. It's per occurrence. And we dedicate the men and women and equipment to that, just like it was a seasonal. Um, we have a very large property up north. It's called Ancient Tree. They have always done it per occurrence. Always. Um, we don't care which way you do it. Your contractor shouldn't care which way you do it. Your contractor has to prove to you, though, that you are a priority, right? You can't be the next day. That doesn't fly. But that's Acres' philosophy. Not they all don't operate that way. I couldn't. I, I can't speak for another company. I can tell you that what you're saying is true. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one that gets a phone call and they say, well, "Okay, what can we do about it?" So I, I, yeah, I would agree with what you're saying. Is that you? And every company's philosophy is different about priority. You're hearing from one of the bigger ones. Um, but I can tell you, I see them in all shapes and sizes and all levels of service from no service, like they don't show a period, yeah. and still cash the checks. So it's, it's a problem. And I, and I can share with you how important we take it. Um, if you're on our winter weather action plan, right, you're going to get an email for every single storm or potential storm during the year. I send the email out. I have my cell phone on. Okay, so 
This goes out to thousands of people. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if people are waiting and they don't know what's going on? Who's going to get the call? Maybe I, I pass him to Stephen though. He's a he's a good sport. But, um, we want to. Do, I shouldn't say that. This is not our commercial. But your contractor should be that responsive, right? They should be there for you. It's really important. Snow is such an incredibly impactful event for people within a community. Um, it's not tomorrow. It's not late. It's in the here and now. Get it done, right? And communicate that to the homeowners, all the homeowners. What's the plan? What can they expect? How do they plan for it? Um, it's critical. Everything that I've heard you discuss, Tom, uh, seems to relate to people having automobiles in their garages. Does this create a whole unique set of circumstances when you have people that are parking in common areas on the street, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, do certain uh, snow removal companies don't even take that contract because they have a challenge working around the car? Right, you can't, you can't plow close to a car. Um, many people believe that you could plow one half of a driveway if there's a car in the other half. You really can't do that. Um, a, it is dangerous, you could damage the car, right? Um, remember, it's ice and snow and stuff and it's slippery. Um, but secondly, there are people that take advantage of that. And we go look at cars that have fenders that are dented Oh my God. And they say, you did that last night, and we go look at it, and it's rusty already. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we do try to accommodate, or the contractor should accommodate the cars to move, to go back, like at a different time, a, a final pass, and take care of that. So in, in, for, this actually came up in Monday's seminar as well. The reality is this. One of the best ways, the best deterrents, to make people understand that they need to move their cars um, is education, right? Get in front of it, you can put out flyers, newsletters, as an association. If in fact somebody chooses to not move their car, which is inevitably gonna happen, if you incur additional costs because Acres or whoever you use has to come back, I'll be the first one to tell you, I'd love to stand in court in front of a judge when you charge that additional cost back to them because they didn't move their car. Um, so that's a, that's a battle I'm more than happy to fight on your behalf because the reality is if their action or inaction results in you as an association incurring additional costs, you go after them. You put it on their account and let them, you know, let, let that play out because I can't imagine a judge not agreeing with you if their lack of, <coughs> excuse me, lack of, uh, Taking the proper, uh, taking the proper steps, costs you as it costs all the neighbors additional money. So you just put education is the single best way. Like, make sure that they're aware of the fact that you can't do the work without that moving their vehicle. Yes, sir. We, we, we have two-inch snow signs out just like the village does. And if we have a two-inch snow and it's not, and people don't move their vehicles, I haven't told. Yeah, that's a very that's a very aggressive approach. Not, but by the way, and and then once you do that. Those few who are outliers, they quickly they oh, see that. They'll see that their car's going to be strapped to a truck and gone. I agree. Right. That's that's a great uh, deterrent. I agree. This just shows a, the discount applies to bulk rate as well. Um, we've covered pretty much all of these, but we'll put them up there just really, really quick. Um, there are benefits and pitfalls to all this. Once again, this is just education. These are things for you to consider. Um, talk to your, the rest of your board, um, talk to Michael or other attorneys, talk to your insurance agent. Um, there are some advantages. Um, it is a way to build a case for acting responsibly. Um, you are going to have better performance from a contractor. If you go with some of those pre-approved plans, the results are going to be better. Um, the property should be safer. Your risk is going to be lessened. Um, but there are pitfalls. We know what those are, right? It's not cheap. We respect that. We really respect that. Um, especially in the first year, might be a consideration. Rather than just jumping in the first year and try to wedge thirteen forty-seven a month more into your budget, maybe the first year, if you want to consider it, just do the freezing rain and freezing drizzle. Step into it. Um, do what you think is most the best decision for your association. Um, this does add liability risk. It may potentially in the future add cost to insurance companies. Um, I've spoken to four insurance companies um, so far to get their opinion on it. 
it really boils down to insurance premium increases as to how many slip and falls you have. The law is one thing, but it's how many they're paying out is the real thing, right? So we think over time, if you're having quite a few claims, that's going to have a dynamic, this is what they're telling me, a pretty significant impact in insurance. If you don't do anything and you don't have any slip and falls, it will mean nothing to your insurance premiums. It's all about the slip and fall. Um, is this better for the contractor? We understand that it is. I mean, it's shifted. But for the last 50 years, everything fell to the contractor. So we're 50 and 1, or we're 1 in 50 then, right, going into this year. So, so if I'm going to sum this up to my two young board members when I get back, Am I going to say, it used to be that the contractor was completely responsible, but well, now... We tried to do that. Now some of it, legally, you can't shift them. As much as I want to hammer the contractor, I legally can't do what... Now they're going to see what we did, uh, our homeowner association. We can't just shift it to the contractor. Yeah, putting our head in the sand is no longer an option. That's a fair summary. Yes. Okay. Mark? Yes, sir. You had a comment earlier about the effective date Sure. To the of the sure. So it was signed. I believe it was signed on the fifth of September, but he signed it in the actual text of the statute, which, by the way, is not a long statute. I, I read a lot of really long statutes that make me want to go to bed. This one is not long. It's like a page and a half. So any one of you could go in and type in the name, and you could pull it up really easy. I pulled it up a second ago when I was looking at mine. Um, so. The answer to the question is, it says the effective date is, at the bottom of the statute, it says the effective date is the 25th of August 2017. So again, look at your contracts, because that date matters. If you sign a contract after that, now the statute applies. Uh, so it, it's just purely based on when you're staying. So assuming those contracts are in place until the end of August. And you'd be surprised how many, you know, we did the seminar on Monday, and people were saying, well, we just signed new contracts. Because I anticipate the contractors being aware of this are going to ask for new contracts um, and want to renegotiate and, and get that additional uh, protection. Um, there was somebody back here had their hand up first. Yes, sir. Uh, you signed it, uh, Browner signed it on September 8th, but it's retroactive back to the 25th? 25th is what it, it says. The effective date is the 25th of August at the bottom of the statute. 2017. So just a month and a half ago. Correct. Correct. What if you amended a contract post, you had a contract in place prior to August 27, 2017, but you had to do some type of amendment uh, subsequent to that? Does that... I still think the act, I mean, it's questionable, what you're saying, but if you were doing very small changes to it, I think the actual contract is still in place. You're talking about an amendment or an addendum. That well, is not the actual something contract. like the pricing thing that... It's Sherman not the actual contract. The terms of the contract were the original contract. Okay. Now you're talking about making subtle changes. That would be my, my opinion. If, okay. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. She was. You said you were all blindsided by this. So who was the pet pusher of all this? What? You, know, you, you, you have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody benefited. Who's Robert, 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 Robert fell somewhere. somewhere. Sorry. Robert, Robert fell somewhere. somewhere. Um, yeah, right. The motivation is what have businesses and people been doing in Illinois the last decade? Leaving. That's right. right? And. The cost of doing business in Illinois is significant. We know that, right? He wants to lower as many costs to keep businesses in the state as possible. Lowering their insurance, if he can lower their insurance and try to keep more companies in here, he believes that's a good thing. We believe that's no motivation. And that, that makes perfect sense. I joked the last time we did the seminar, I said, boy, that, who knew that they had such great lobbyists? Yeah. Right? Who knew that the snow removal companies? Uh, but his, his, uh, that makes perfect sense. I think that the the intent and the benefit of it is it's, it may keep businesses, small businesses here, uh, and he, keep them in business. I mean, it, it really does make a lot of sense. Their insurance premiums are down, less claims made against them. Yes, sir. Hi. This uh, handout sheet that we all got, first sentence says, what is it? New law signed by Governor Brown on September 8th. 2016. It's a typographical error. It wasn't signed on the 16th. It wasn't signed by no, no, no. 2016. It's like over a calendar year. I just, I just but it went into effect on the 7th. date is 2016. 
it, it was, that was, okay, the effective date, I can tell you, looking at it right now, I have to statute up on my, my computer over here, is August 25th of 2017, the effective date. Which is what matters. When he signed it, it's somewhat irrelevant. It's the effective date that matters to All right, so it should go into effect. If we sign the contract prior to August 25th of 2017, then it should be okay. Correct. All right. Correct. Why does it lower businesses' <laughs> premiums? I don't understand that. Because they have less claims filed against them. If all of those claims, if every slip and fall got pinned on them, they're going to have more claims. Oh, it's just those businesses that we're talking about, not all correct. businesses. Correct. Just the snow removal. Correct. Snow okay. big. Correct. Okay. Which is, yeah, or, it's, or, it's a big. Or, or any, anything. I mean, People yeah, slip and fall on, on, they triple on the sidewalk, right? Or they trip on a curve. Or, and this could be the precursor to many more. And, right. and guys, just based on time right now, we have to, if you want, we're going to take a five or ten minute break. Five minute, five minute break. I, I hope that you'll stick around. There's a lot of changes in the law that I want to go through. I'll go through them quickly. Okay. The, uh, the fun discussion of the night. Um, we're, obviously, we are here to talk about changes in law. Uh, we spent a good amount of time talking about the new statute that uh, Sherm and Akers uh, presented with myself on. Um, you guys are in an inter interesting position as board members. Um, the reality is it's a moving target. The laws are changing. Case law is coming down. Um, I feel your pain because I kind of live it. So I'm responsible for knowing all of the different things that happen, the different changes. It certainly keeps us on our toes, so I know that either it keeps you really scrambling in your mind or you just simply don't choose to not know about it. And I can tell you right now the people in this room obviously care enough to uh, be educated and stay on top of it um, because there's a great deal of board members who simply just choose the path of least resistance, which is somewhat ignorance, right? To just not know what the law says and what the changes are. So kudos to you to begin with. Um, I want to start with uh, the Common Interest Community Association Act changes. By a show of hands, uh, how many people here does that do, falls under that category or that statute? Um, I can tell you right now, some of you may not know the answer to that question. Um, so there's the Illinois Condominium Property Act. So condo associations are governed by that. Some townhome associations are governed by that statute as well. Um, the way you know the answer to that is you look at your declaration, and usually in the preamble, and one of the definitions will be the act. It'll tell you which statute by which the association is uh, governed. Um, if you don't know the answer, which is perfectly fine, that's a piece of homework, find out what statute governs your association. Uh, it's the first question that I want answered when somebody asks me a question. I want to figure out what my universe is, right? I want to know what statutes apply to you, uh, what your declaration, bylaws, amendments, rules, and regulations say. Then at least I can narrow down what it is that, where I can find the answer. Um, and you guys as board members uh, should want to do the same thing. Know what your universe is so you're not you know, staring at a statute that doesn't even apply to your association. You'd be surprised how often I answer that question. What about section so-and-so of the Condo Act? Well, sir, ma'am, you don't even not follow that statute. So it's quite irrelevant. Um, so the Common Interest Community Association Act, notably there's just two changes in the statute. Okay. Most of the changes, uh, I don't want to rain on anybody's parade, that's governed by SECA, the Common Interest Community Association Act. But most of the changes uh, are with the Condo Act. Two changes. Um, whether or not you're aware of this, if you've ever tried to amend your declaration, um, it's, it's a hot thing right now, right? People are amending because of leasing. Leasing's the single biggest thing I do. It makes my head want to explode sometimes because I draft so many leasing restriction amendments. Uh, dealing with Airbnb, VRBO, all of the short-term rentals. Uh, who do you, you know, you don't want to become a rental community. Uh, what, one of the things that a lot of declarations say is that not only do you need X number of your members, usually it's two-thirds or 75%, a lot of declarations will have a secondary requirement, which will be mortgage holder approval. Okay? And usually it's about, it says 51% of the first mortgage holders have to give uh, approval. And what law firms have always done for years and years and years to get around that is to simply state in the notice we send them that if you don't respond within the next X number of days, your approval will be, your approval will, you will have been deemed to approve of the amendment. And if anybody, I don't want to offend anybody in the banking industry or uh, that industry, but frankly, they're so overwhelmed with foreclosed properties 
and everything else that's going on, that they're never responding. I think in all the years I've done, you know, I've done hundreds of amendments, and I think I've gotten two or three letters back from a bank, and they were usually like six or seven months later. So what this change in the statute is, and by the way, this statute, this, this change applies to both SECA, the Common Interest Community Association Act, which I'm going to continue to call SECA because it's shorter, and the Condo Act, it's the same thing. It now requires that you have to send out your notice if your declaration requires it. And now instead of just the number that we were making up saying within 21 days, now it's statutory that you have to give them 60 days notice. And if they do not respond within 60 days, their approval is deemed to have been given. Okay? Two effects. One, it allows us to just do it mechanically. They never respond. The negative impact, though, is that you have to wait two months. Right? So everybody's in a big rush to get an amendment to be recorded and now this put a 60-day hold essentially if your declaration requires it. That's important because some declarations simply don't have this secondary requirement. So again, we have to look at your documents, determine if that's applicable. If it is, we send it out after it's already been approved by the membership. So we don't bother messing with the banks until we know that we actually have the approval from the membership. Uh, and then you have a 60-day grace period where you have to wait till it is in fact, until uh, you can in fact record it. Um, it is what it is. Yes. Good question. Sure. What about a restatement of your declarations, just uh, to to bring it up to Great current question. law and uh, to take out all the developer language? Yep. Amendment. So there's two types. It's a great it's question. Really there's two types of there's there's two types of, uh, of of amendments, right? There's an amendment to make substantive changes, like how many pets you can have leasing, anything that is substantive in nature that you're changing about your documents. That is something that requires a board, I'm sorry, a member approval, and that's when the mortgage requirement is triggered. Okay. If you are making a change to bring the document up to the current state of the law, okay, meaning to comply with the changes we're doing here tonight, um, I can assure you every single person's documents in here right now violate the statute, okay, because the law has changed. Unless 15 minutes ago we recorded your declaration, it has inconsistencies. That's just the reality of the world. The law keeps changing, and, and I'm not telling you that you need to run out and amend your document all the time. Every 10 to 15 years, you should consider doing it. Um, it's terrible, the concept of every time there's a new buyer and you hand them a declaration and you're giving them a document that violates the law. Okay, it's not the best thing in the world, but it's not practical to always be amending the document. But the, remember, the statute does override the provisions of your doc, of your declaration if they conflict with each other. Um, so that's one of the changes to answer your question. If you're just bringing it up to the state of the law, that's a board vote. The board has the right to bring, and it's somewhat common sense, that you should have the right to change your document to comply with the law. Um, some attorneys take the position that you can pull out um, irrelevant provisions like the declarant language. Um, I can tell you a couple of my partners take the position you can't do that, that, that would, that's a substantive change. You know what? I can disagree with some of my partners, that's perfectly fine. Um, whether or not you want to streamline it, um, that's about as silly as a declaration having a, a reference to an elevator and the building doesn't have an elevator. Yeah. My position is you can take that out. You don't have an elevator, okay? So why are we talking about it? Uh, but that's, that's my position. Um, the other change, um, I can tell you right now, I'm not an accountant. I took a couple of years of accounting in college. That's about the extent of my accounting background. Um, both statutes now, uh, require that the generally accepted accounting practices, so GAAP, uh, be used uh, if your association has more than 100 units. Who decided 100 was the correct number? God only knows. Um, I think that should just be just as relevant if you're a 99 unit association, but that's what the, uh, the statute says now. So that's something I would challenge you as a board to go to your accountant with. The, accountant, the accountants in, in the industry, the CPAs, are going to be aware of this change. Um, I don't know that that's going to impact you. I don't know, as, as I said, I'm not an accountant. I don't know what, if you were following those practices already, it just needs to be understood that now the statute requires that it be done. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. What did, what did you say about substantive? What, what was the change there? Are we going back to the Yeah, back discussion? to number one. Okay. I didn't. Sure. The, if you're making substantive changes, your, your declaration has a provision as to it requires a vote of the members, and it may require mortgage holder approval. Right. If it is not substantive and it's just oh. bringing it up to the state of the law, the board has the right to make oh. those changes. So there's really two types of amended and restated declarations. Okay, so that's something. Basically, it's a, a tear up the document and start over. 
If you're tearing it up and it's just to bring it up to the state of the law, you as a board can do that. If you're tearing it up to make a bunch of changes, that requires membership approval. Yes, sir. With regard to the owners, my understanding is there's no time limit on that. But would you have to have affirmative approval you're, of? You're half right. Right? You're half right. Okay. So here's the answer. Yeah. Declarations have two different types of provisions in the amendment section. You can go right to the end of your declaration, and it's almost the, one of the last sections of everybody's declaration in here. It says one of two things. It says that it can be either done at a special meeting, and the vote has to be done in person or by proxy, at a special meeting. That means that you actually have to have a meeting in which time that's when the vote takes place, in person or by proxy. Meaning that if you don't get the necessary vote, those votes are no good anymore, and you have to hold another vote and start over. That's one of the ways the declaration is written. The other way, and that's one of the first things I look at, because it's either really hard or not as hard, is that it'll say that the association has to collect those votes, and it doesn't give a time frame or a meeting requirement. So you can, by petition, go around and continue to collect votes over an extended period of time, being mindful of if somebody moves or if somebody changes their position, you have to account for that. Okay, so, but otherwise, it, the, state, the document doesn't give a time frame, and you could continue to collect votes conceivably, and then as soon as you have the necessary votes, you call the special meeting. So you're half right. Half of the time, I'd say it's almost a 50-50 proposition. Some of them require there to be a special meeting. It's a little harder, right? Because you've got to actually get the people to either show up or give proxies. That's a harder threshold to meet. Um, Don't you need two-thirds? It's either two-thirds or 75 percent. Okay. So the minimum is two-thirds, so the could statute says Could you also do the same thing like you did with the bank? If you don't respond, it's an affirmative? No. You need to actually, the, stat, the, the provision will say you need the affirmative vote. Yes, sir. See, I'm confused about uh, proxy versus vote. I thought proxy just gives you permission Correct. to vote. Correct. Yeah, so if you, if you if it says in person or by proxy, if you give your proxy to somebody else, they can go in the, the, the yeah, vote on their behalf. Oh, yeah, there actually yeah, has to be a ballot cast. Yeah. Every, and I don't want to go down, because yeah. I'm going to lose my back right, with this yeah. lady over here. But the reality is a proxy is not a, a ballot, yeah, it's not a vote. It just gives the right to somebody else to step somebody in your shoes. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on to the conduct. Those are the two provisions that changed in the Common Interest Community Association Act. Um, okay, real quickly. Um, you guys probably all heard the, the case called Palm. I mean, everybody's head crazy for a little while. Um, one of the main things that came out of Palm was how that particular association was dealing with their surplus and deficits. Okay, so they had surplus money in one account, and they were simply doing magic tricks and just moving the money over to reserves. By the way, the industry had been doing that for years. Um, nobody was really paying any attention to what their documents said. And what the court said is, by the way, common sense, I've used that term a lot tonight. Common sense would have told you you should follow what your declaration says. And associations just for years weren't doing that. They were just saying, hey, we have excess operating. We didn't spend as much money on, on snow removal this year. We're just going to put that money in reserves. What they didn't take into consideration is their declaration contemplated what to do with surplus. Their declaration said that you either have to credit or you have to refund, because declarations have provisions. And I'd say about 85% of them say this is what you're supposed to do in the event of a shortfall, so a deficit, or a surplus. You have to, common sense again, follow what your declaration says. Um, then, so now you, you fast forward to now, and the legis legislature has put a provision in that says it creates options. It gives the board some authority to choose what to do with excess funds. Here's the problem. It says, to the extent that there is not any contrary provision in the association's declaration or bylaws. Well, darn it, didn't they just miss the target? Because basically, I said 85% of declarations have a contrary provision. So if your declaration is silent, you can do what you could have did anyway. But now this particular provision spells it out. It gives you your specific options. Legally, we were telling you if it was silent, you have the right to move it. But you have to follow what your declaration says. This basically says, follow what your declaration says. So. The, the answer, the moral of the story is if you want to do, you have two real good options. If you want to take excess operating funds and move them to reserves, two options. One, amend your budget. Okay, you can amend your budget at any time during the year. You amend it the same way you approved and adopted it, the original budget. So if you have an extra $50,000 laying around and you want that money to not have to be refunded or returned to your members, you amend your budget 
and you simply reallocate the money and allocate more money to reserves. That's option number one. Do you have, excuse me, do you have to notify the members if you yeah, amend the, same, the budget? The same way you passed the original budget. Mm -hmm. yep. So you do so you have to do a And the statute changed, by the way, so 25 days instead of 30. So you have to send out the proposed amended budget at least 25 days in advance of the member meeting at which you're going to discuss and approve the amended budget. The process is the same as, as you do for your regular budget. That's option number one. Option number two is amend the provision that says that you have to refund it. Now, we all know amending is not all that fun to do, but that's the other way you could do it, right? You could simply take that provision out and give discretion to the board and follow this, what the statute says. Give options to the board on how they handle uh, surplus funds. So those are really the two major options that you have as a board. You can't just do magic tricks and move the money to reserves because you're, you're breaching your fiduciary duty, you're not following your declaration. And if you do not, you just roll it over into the next year. Well, that would be violating your declaration if it says that you have excess operating funds that need to be refunded. So, a lot of people are doing that. A lot of people are doing but the reality is that's not what your declaration requires, so you would be violating your declaration. Uh, moving on, whether or not you guys are aware of it, there's a lot of buildings, in, mostly in the city of Chicago, that there's investors coming in and buying the whole building. It's called a Section 15 deconversion. It's essentially turning condominium buildings into rental properties. It's very popular right now. I prob my firm probably has 20 or 30 of them going on at any one time that we are in the process of negotiating with investors because evidently it's better to have rental property right now as far as making money than it is to have condominium units. So that fad will pass. I continue. I really believe that that is a short-term fad, but right now it's happening. What this particular change is is that it's Section 15 of the Condo Act talks about how you evaluate the property. Whether or not you know this, I don't want to blow anybody's mind. But if 75% of your community wants to sell the entire building, the other 25 is out of luck. Okay, so you could you could own your place free and clear. You want to retire there. If 75% of your entire community, by percentage of ownership, decides to sell the entire building, there is a mechanism by which you can be forced out of your unit. Jeez. It's unbelievable, but it's there. So what the change was is it created an additional uh, and better uh, proposal and option for members to evaluate their units to get paid more money. Okay. The original one was where you get different appraisals, and you would, it actually resulted in a lawsuit if you said, no, I'm not going to leave. There's a whole trigger events that you have to have. There's a lawsuit filed, appra independent appraisals are done, yada, yada, yada. There's a lot of process that goes into it. Now there's a new proposal or there's a new option. They kept that same one, but now you actually can be repaid what you owe plus your uh, relocation expenses. So what it did is it kind of made it better for individual members who are being forced out of an association <coughs> to be properly compensated. Uh, it's just something that's in the Condo Act that very little people, very few people know about. Um, so anyway, now you know about it. Moving on, um, Section uh, 18, there's a whole bunch of changes. The changes I'm going to go through really quickly because all they were, it's the same thing that was there before, but the amount of time was, was uh, lengthened. Okay, so there was a time, or, or maybe you're aware of, there's a provision that says if you uh, increase your budget from one year to the next, by 15, by more than 15%, the membership has a petition right to try to overturn your uh, increase in the budget. Okay, before it used to be 14 days to petition, now it's 21. Um, so just understand they have that right. If you as a board jack up their assessments, they actually have some recourse, and now they have 21 days to file the petition. Um, likewise, uh, whether or not you're aware of this. Boards sometimes enter into contracts with family members. Um, and sometimes it, it can be looked at as self-dealing, but it's not as long as it's, if it's disclosed and open to the membership. Um, the reality is they always the membership had a petition right of 20 days to challenge that contract. Now they have 30 days. So it just extended the amount of time they have to, uh, to challenge the action of the board. Another one of the changes is as it relates to uh, uh, elections done by secret ballot or mail-in uh, ballot. Um, before they had a, they had 14 days to to challenge that. Now they had to, to changing the election process to that. Now they have 30 days to uh, challenge the board's decision to make it a secret or mail-in balloting. 
Another change, and the best example is putting in a brand new swimming pool. Okay, so if you have a capital improvement that increases the annual budget of more than 5%, okay, so if you are going to all of a sudden have a 5% increase and the sole purpose is to put a luxurious swimming pool in, um, the membership has a triggered right to petition to stop that awesome swimming pool that you were going to put in. Um, it was 21 days, I'm sorry, it was 14 days, now it's 21 days they have to petition. Uh, that's the end of these little silly changes. Uh, as I already said, the accounting practices changed. You have to follow, if you have 100 units, the generally accepted accounting practices or principles. Michael, does that one uh, matter if you're a not-for-profit organization? Most of us are not-for-profit. I'd say 99.99999% of you guys are not-for-profit. You're all governed by the Illinois, Con the Illinois General Not-for-Profit Corporation. I, I didn't even think that non-for-profits are moving close enough to GAP. You know, you, so now you have an obligation to follow these it principles, like they're, principles. They're being stronger than the rest of the accounting profession. <laughs> so just it's something to, it's something to discuss with your accountant for your association. They should be keenly aware of this change because this is I mean that's their specific area. Um, so they should be keenly aware of it. But it doesn't hurt for you to bring it up. The single most impactful change I can tell you right now, the one that's going to get everybody uh, and add and add a layer of work and exposure to associations is Section 19. Section 19 is the, the infamous records request section. Okay, we all have probably dealt with uh, a busybody owner that wants to see every piece of paper in your association and wants to drive you bonkers by seeing every contract and every expenditure. Um, and the way the, the, what it used to say is that you had 30 days to respond uh, and to provide records to, to individual owners. That has now been changed to 10 days. Okay, that's a pretty big change. What it mirrors is what the city of Chicago ordinance is. That's the only thing I can think of why they did that. They went to the same, the same requirement of the city of Chicago. But I can tell you, it's 10 business days. But 10 days is an awfully short amount of time to compile voluminous records. Okay, so management companies, this is gonna be a difficult thing for them to do. Boards, if the person who gets it is, goes on vacation and disappears, you could very well blow the statute. And why it's relevant is, the statute says that if you don't comply, you arguably and you arguably could be responsible for the other side's attorney's fees. Okay, so if you still, don't comply, we can still charge for that. Yes, absolutely. You have they still have the same rights. In fact, before it said you shall charge, which means it was required. The statute just changed part of the, one of the changes here is it says you may. So the board could actually choose not to charge if they wanted to. Before it said they were required to. Um, but it's impactful because you could be if you if the days of shuffling paper off to the side and dealing with it later really aren't there anymore. You have an obligation within 10 days uh, I, to, to respond and to supply these records. What I will tell you is that if it's a voluminous request, it's always gonna be my position that you could, that's an argument in court. If you say, judge, I responded to them, I told them that they were looking for 500,000 documents and that it was gonna take me more time, I would happily make that argument with a judge and I have a feeling you're not gonna end up being responsible for the attorney's fees. But if you take a technical reading of it, hyper-technical, you would be, you could be responsible for the legal fees if you don't comply. Um, I will tell you that one of, the, one of the big things we always said from the legal profession is proper purpose, right? You would say, well, you don't have a proper purpose. Well, the statute now changed to kind of re eliminate the concept of proper purpose Okay, so they, basically what the legislature is saying is that members should have more access, more rights to access association records. I don't agree with that, by the way, because I, I actually get stuck dealing with the fishing expedition where somebody is just literally looking for something that the board did wrong so that they can challenge something. Uh, but that's what it says now. What it says is that, you have, that they have to certify that it's for a, commercial, a non-commercial purpose meaning it can't be something, you know, they couldn't be asking for records for any you know, business purpose. Um, what that actually means, commercial purpose, is still up for interpretation. Um, I'm always leery because one of the records that they can request is name, address, and weighted, uh, what your weighted percentage of ownership is in a condo. By the way, that now changed, and it says the board is to maintain a list of email addresses, telephone numbers of all of the members for examination. That's pretty impactful, right? Now, these, now the, the crazy person in your association who wants to overthrow the board can, get, can petition and seek a copy of email addresses and phone numbers. Yikes, 
That's here's the, because now you, you have that information much more available. Yes, sir. When this stuff is talking about these requests being made to the board, mm -hmm. obviously we have a management company that has all this stuff. So right. the person is requesting to the board, but we only meet once a month. So don't we just automatically have a waiver of that time frame because we're not able to act on that as a board until we meet? No, so here's, here's the reality of that. First of all, you could call a meeting on 48 hours notice of the board, so that's, it's not gonna be an acceptable answer to say, by the way, we don't meet. But here's the reality of it is, you, on the back side of that, if you say we have a records request and management company, because they are usually the keeper of the records, mm -hmm. please have these records pulled together, I already, I already know the person who's going to bear the brunt of, of this change is the management company, because mm -hmm. they're the ones that are gonna have to sift through boxes and archives mm -hmm and try to find these things. And by the way, there's gonna be retrieval time and cost, which you have the right legally to pass back. So my letter in response, which usually shuts down about two thirds of requests, is I say, these are the different records we have that are responsive to your request. If you choose to have us pull these documents together, this will be the cost. And when I tell them that it's like $150 per hour, plus the copying cost, the people literally vanish because nobody wants to spend $800 to find out that there's nothing in the record. That so we can pass that, that on to Absolutely, the statute gives you the right. It has to be retrieval in actual right. copy cost. So it has to be tied to something. You can't just make up a fictitious number, but if ACM <laughs> has a charge for document retrieval that's over and above their actual cost, yeah. which, which means the real cost of the association, yeah. for this person on a fishing expedition, you have the absolute right by statute to charge that back to them. And I like to point that out to them in advance. To the requester. To the requester. Can you right. ask for the money up front? I usually do. I yeah. say that we want to we want to certify show up yeah. Yeah. and we will we will release the records to you yeah. if you sure. give us certified funds and then by the way, That's let them go to court then and challenge them. Judge, we made them available. Right. They did not want to pay the fee of, of what came with it. Yes, sir. Um, is there any need to have any sort of rule like that in your rules that you're going to make those charges or if, if we've never experienced Don't give them the idea. Yeah. You, you, can, you can certainly put it in your rules, but the statute is what, get, what actually gives you the right. So it's statute driven. It says the board, there's a whole section in uh, section 19 uh, towards the end that talks about your ability to recover your actual copy costs and retrieval costs. What that means, retrieval, I mean, come on, it, it's kind of a, you know, you guys can interpret it any way you want to. A judge at the end of the day is going to decide if charging him $1,200 to, you know, to look at a couple documents is reasonable. Um, the judge is going to most likely charge him something, but it may not be the full, the full freight. Yes, ma'am, you are. Yeah, is uh, there any document they aren't allowed to have? No, the statute is very specific, okay? I think there's nine categories of things that they're entitled to, okay? And people's minds are usually blown that you have an obligation as an association to keep the books and records, so the, the expenditures, and, and the income, like it's basically you're just, it's your ledgers for 10 uh, years, uh -huh. okay? So you have a 10-year obligation. Your meeting minutes, seven years. Uh, your contracts, one year after, so you have to have them for one year. Um, your insurance policy, your current insurance policies. Um, so there's things that they have the right to review, um, things that they don't have the right to see, which blows my mind all the time. People want to see the proposals, okay? So you had three proposals for uh, a snow removal company. Where does it say that they have the right to see proposals? They don't. Um, if you have a, uh, an inspection report done on something, it doesn't say anything about them having the right to see an inspection report. If you have a reserve study done, it doesn't say anything about a reserve study. Really? So these people all want to see these records, but statutorily, there's nothing that gives them that right. If you as a board choose to make it available, that's on you, uh, but it's not statutorily required. Census records. What do you mean census records? Well, we take a census of all 300... And that, that's a document that's retained within the association. There's nothing in the statute that says you keep that for your own so you know who is on the property. Right. As it relates to the members, they have, they have a right to information about owners, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't be anything to do with tenants. They have the right to the now with the statute change. And by the way, I want to make sure this is understood. As of, these are all January 1st, okay? So you have a few more months before all hell breaks loose. Um, you have until Jan these are all still going into effect January 1st. They have the right as it relates to an owner, name, address, phone number, email, 
phone number and email are the new changes, right. and wait and vote. They have no right to anything else. Yeah, that's what I understood. I just think about my document. No, they don't have a right to that. They have no right. Could you be surprised what members think that they have the right to, and they simply don't have that right? Yes, ma'am. Owners. 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 Your entire membership. The statute has always said. The statute. The statute says what it says. They have a right to name, address, phone number, email, and rated vote. That's what it says. Yes, ma'am. Well, we we were talking about getting a directory um, for for our our owners, and some people don't want to give that information out. So does this mean that now we are responsible for providing? If somebody refuses to give it to you, okay, because what the statute says is that the association has the responsibility to, what does it say? It says, maintain a list. The board must maintain a list. If somebody says no, what are you going to do? Go to the door with a gun? No. So you have no control over if somebody refuses to give you that information. Okay. Okay. But it's, I would put that on the list. So-and-so, unit so-and-so refuses. And, and the reality is this, too. I know a lot of people that, because of the email thing, they're just cheating. They're, they're opening a new email account for associations because day. nobody wants to get flooded with all their neighbors' you know, grievances. Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. i got to get moving on then. Can a person opt out of their information being shared? They might want to provide it to the uh, association, but they might not want to share it. It's not what the statute says. If they, if they refuse to give it, that's a whole new legal battle. But as this reads... All of the members are entitled to get that information out of the other members. Now it can't be again, it can't be for a commercial purpose. So they can't be using it to solicit and do different, you know, as far as business related. So it, I'm reporting the news. It is what it is, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, moving on, because there's a few more things. Uh, section 27 um, is actually what we already talked about, the 60 days. Uh, for uh, amendments to the documents, you have to send it out to the mortgage holder 60 days. I did want to bring up one other case because I think there's one really important case. It's not the one that's on this handout. There's a case that came out called Stobie, and what it does is that it addresses the right to restrict leasing by uh, how you legally can restrict leasing. Okay, what it basically says is that if your declaration um, contemplates leasing in any way, like all it says is one sentence in the document. And all it says is that leases must be for at least one year, okay? So it's, it, it clearly addresses leasing. That's the only thing it says. The industry for many, many years before this case came out said, and it was pursuant to a case called Apple II, was that you had the right to then adopt reasonable rules and regulations further restricting leasing, okay? And that had been what people were doing for years. We always said, as a, from a legal position, you were always best to have amended the declaration. That's always the safest. Judges don't, don't nearly scrutinize that as hard as they do rules. But under Apple II, people were taking the aggressive approach saying you could adopt reasonable rules and regulations as it relates to leasing. This case came out and said this in a nutshell. It said, if your declaration contemplates leasing in any way, you would, the only way that you can further restrict, meaning any additional restrictions, is by way of an amendment to the declaration. Okay? The only, there's two caveats to that. Unless your declaration is completely silent, and I see some, probably about 5%, say nothing about leasing, then you can do it by rule, okay? That's one way. The other way is some declarations will explicitly say that it'll have provisions and it'll say, and, and uh, pursuant to the reasonable rules and regulations adopted by the board of directors related to leasing. So if it gives the, directly and explicitly gives that authority to the board, then you can do rules and that's perfectly fine. But otherwise, if you have a rule, this case says that those are unenforceable, null and void, however you want to term it, that if you have adopted a set of rules that goes further than what your declaration says, and this case came, came out, I don't know, a little less than a year ago, those are not going to be enforceable. Yes, sir? So if there are units that are rented yep. in your association, can the association charge that owner more than the standard association fee? No. No, they, here's what they can charge them. There's, there's novel ways of doing it. They can't charge more as an assessment, okay? The assessments are tied directly to your percentage of ownership. What they can do, though, is if they're, because I, I would certainly be willing to argue that there's more work involved with having a tenant, because you have to administer, you have to get copies of the lease, uh, you may have to worry about keys, uh, you know, uh, garage door openers. So there are associations that will adopt a fee, like an administrative fee for leasing, an annual fee. 
That's perfectly fine. That's very normal. I see it all the time. So if you have fees, move in, move out fees, for example, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a move in, move out fee. It has to be tied to something. I know judges are going to say, well, where did you come up with that number? I have a couple of associations that charge like $1,000 for an administrative fee. Well, a judge is going to look at them like they're crazy. Like, where did you come up with that number? Uh, but if you're charging $100 or $200 because somebody has to track leases and keep track of updating information, uh, or if it's move in, move out, you have to pad elevators, or you have to, you know, there's potential damage. Um, you know, if you're holding a deposit and you return it, that's all perfectly acceptable. But your assessment can, that, that can have nothing to do with the assessment. Yes, sir. I'm going to put you back on the leasing, uh, the A or N A uh, to a SICA Townhome Association. Yep. The uh, governing documents are uh, silent mm -hmm. on leasing. Um, so could an association then, with nothing, just establish restrictions or eliminate the possibility? They can. So here's the problem. Let's, let's talk about it conceptually. The reason, why they, the reason why the court system wants it to be done by amendment is because that shows up on a title search. It's a recorded document. If you do it by rule, it's not a recorded document. And there's a high probability that somebody could buy a unit and never have the opportunity to know. They could be an investor and say, I'm going to buy this unit. Um, so you have a higher probability of being challenged, and it's going to be a man or a woman in a black robe who's going to decide whether or not that's enforceable. I can tell you by this case that came out, it explicitly states, now it's what I would call dicta because it's just like some, some add-on language towards the end that talks about that, but if it's completely silent, then I think you're on a much better footing to adopt rules and regulations about leasing. Again, the single best way would be to do it by amendment. The next best option, because amendments are hard to do, I've got a number of communities that I have told flat out, you will lose if this is challenged. Okay, but they still want the rule because 75% of the people don't challenge it. They just say, okay, I guess I can't lease. Uh, so it's, it's your first I've heard about the uh, title search. Yeah, so <laughs> rules are not recorded. Uh, I, I guess I've seen associations that have chose to record their rules, but it's not required uh, because they're amended. The board is the one who amends rules and regulations. So they change, by the way, I, I review and change rules way more than I would like to admit. I mean, it's constant because boards are, new boards come in and they want something different. Right. So they're an ever-evolving document. Anybody else? Yes, sir. What's the name of that case? It's Stobie versus, and email me, because it's some, it's some downtown Chicago uh, high-rise building. But it applies to? It applies to the county. Of yes, yes. Now, is it because it takes, so it's a Chicago, it's a Cook County case mm -hmm. that makes it persuasive authority on other counties. I have no reason to think that other counties wouldn't follow it because it's, it's apples to apples as opposed to you know, apples to bananas. Um, but it's persuasive authority as opposed to binding authority. Other Cook County courts are bound by that and have to follow it. If you're outside of Cook County, it's persuasive authority, meaning they, that somebody can argue and use that and the court should follow it, but they can choose not to. Okay, with that said, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I appreciate you guys sticking around.